Hello, welcome back to Physics 272. I feel the same way, except I'm sad today because it's our last lecture. And you may have noticed that I like teaching you about physics, so I'm sad. I'm going to miss teaching you about physics. Um, but anyway, it's been a fantastic semester, so thanks for all your contributions and coming to class and saying woo every time I say hey, welcome to Physics 272. So you know you have a final exam, all right? Study hard and good luck. We hope you do well on the exam. We always hope you do the best that you personally can. And we hope that the class as a whole has learned a ton of great physics. Last time, we completed Maxwell's equations. And this was very exciting, not only for the really exciting theoretical physics aspect of the set of equations together is just beautiful, but also for the fact that with the four Maxwell equations in hand, including the time dependence that we've finished out now, if you took that sheet of paper and went back in time, you could revolutionize society. So basically, uh, a lot of our modern society, especially the fact that we are a global society, that's enabled by Maxwell's equations. Um, <clears throat> so today, we are not going to get to all that stuff. To, that's a lot. So there's a lot in the notes that are online um, that we're not going to get to today. But we will get to wave solutions of the electromagnetic waves, OK? So wave solutions of Maxwell's equations. And we'll see that if we accelerate charges, that's how to start an electromagnetic wave. And we'll also, if we have time for it, get to why the sky is blue. Because uh, you know, at some point in your life, at some point, you're going to have some cute little small child come up to you and with you know, blinking eyes and say, you got a degree from Purdue. You must know why the sky is blue. So I have to tell you that, right? So can you imagine my core kids, when they ask me this, I'm like, <laughs> Give me a pencil and paper, and I'll give you Maxwell's equation. So, you know, my poor four-year-old is going, Mommy, no more math. Anyway, so here they are, all right? Right there. That's why the sky's blue. No, I'm just kidding. We'll get there. Um, so these are the full story of uh, electricity and magnetism. This is everything there is to know. On the right-hand side, I've got the integral forms. Last time, we derived the differential forms, OK? And that was a lot of math that I don't expect you to be able to reproduce on your own. I simply proved it to you so that you know that, OK, this set of equations, which is its integral form, the way I know it's an integral form is because there's integrals in it, is exactly equivalent to what's the left-hand side here, which is the differential forms, OK? So they're exactly equivalent. You can use whichever one you need in particular contexts. And basically, the top two equations are about either enclosed flux or divergence. And they're about the same idea, which is that if I have a point charge, it'll have an electric field coming off of it. And as the electric field comes off of it, the field lines radiate out. And so the lines diverge from each other. And that means you'll, you'll catch a divergence if you're using the, uh, the math that's about differentials. Okay, You'll catch what's called a divergence term. Or if you're doing it in the integral form, what you'll see is that diverging field has a net flux through a closed surface. So same physics. And also, we saw that there were certain kinds that were about curling fields. So you could either express that as a circulation in the integral form, where I walk around a closed loop and pick up all the components of the field that are parallel to me as I walk around that closed loop. That's a circulation. The equivalent form for differentials is what's called a curl. So it's a, it's a derivative that's a kind of a curling derivative. All right, And I showed you the math to that last time. All right, and, and you know, the new exciting thing that we did in the past two weeks was we put in the time-dependent pieces. So now that we have the time-dependent pieces, the pieces that say, if there's a changing electric flux, I must have a magnetic field arise. And then, that means there's a changing magnetic field. So if I have a changing magnetic flux, that causes an electric field. Well, that's a changing electric field. If I have a changing electric field, it causes a magnetic field. So you see how this kind of goes on forever, right? So in fact, I, that's what I'd like to show you today, is that piece of the equations that say you can get something that propagates forever. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start from the differential form. What we're going to do is take the differential form of Maxwell's equations, and I'd like to analyze them in a region of space that's, that's free space. So no charges in this region of space and no currents in this region of space. So what we'll assume is that somewhere else in the universe, Somebody wiggled some charges and started an electromagnetic wave. And then I want to see what happens in the free space region. So over here on the right-hand side, I've copied Maxwell's equations down. But in my region of space, there's no charge density, so I set that to 0. And there's no current, so I set that term to 0. Okay? So this is, this is in the absence of charges. These two equations are the ones that say 
Once a wave starts, it just keeps on going. And the reason is because a changing magnetic field causes a curling electric field. And then that changing electric field causes a curling magnetic field and so forth. So we'll see that these guys just kind of bootstrap each other and cause everything to wiggle back and forth. So what we're going to do is take those two equations, okay, del cross E is minus dB by dt, and del cross B is mu naught epsilon naught dE by dt, put those two equations together, and we'll see that we get one big differential equation that is the wave equation. So remember, I have this disclaimer about how you actually solve differential equations. The way you solve differential equations is you take the differential equation you have and you knock on the door of the math department and you say, I have this equation. What solves it? And they tell you because it takes a lot of work to prove the actual solution. Okay, so we take the answer from the math department or we'll from alpha, your, your choice. So we're going to feed one equation into the other, get a wave equation out, and then we'll see what the structure of that solution looks like. So let me start with del cross b, back up a little bit here, let me start with uh, del cross b is mu naught epsilon naught dE by dt. By the way, you may remember that mu naught epsilon naught is 1 over c squared. So already hiding in here is the speed of light. All right? So I want to take another curl. This is the curl of b. I'm going to take a curl of this whole equation. So del cross of that whole equation, del cross b, is mu naught epsilon naught dE by dt. Let me remind you what the del operator looks like, by the way. So the del operator the del operator is a derivative that's in vector form. So del looks like this. d by dx, comma d by dy, comma d by dz. Okay, it means when this operator is fed something in the x component, it takes an x derivative of it. When this operator is fed something in its y component, it takes a y derivative of it, and so on. So it's, a, it's what you call a vector operator. An operator is something that you can kind of think of it as eating a function and then spitting something else out. Okay? So it, it does something to a function. Um, so that's this operator here. So I'm taking a del cross of del cross b. And I'll do that on both sides. So the left-hand side just gives us del cross del cross b. The right-hand side, mu naught, epsilon naught, comes straight down. Now I should have had a del cross d by dt of e. I've written it here in the opposite order. Okay? I've written it here as d by dt of del cross e. You remember how math goes? You read math right to left. Okay? So the way math goes is this math up here says, first take the time derivative of the electric field, and then take the curl of that. This math down here says first take the curl and then take the time derivative. That is OK because time and space are independent coordinates. So I switch the order and it's OK. All right? <coughs> time and space don't bother each other. So now I have this del cross E sitting around. Well, I have a Maxwell equation for that, right? I have a Maxwell equation that says del cross E is minus dB by dt. So I'll just feed that in. And that comes right here. OK. So now I have this minus dB by dt <laughs> sitting there. And then we'll simplify that a little bit as well. Okay, so now I'm going to use that mu naught epsilon naught is 1 over c squared. So that's going to be sitting right there. And notice what happened here. I now have, if I look at the far left hand side, I have two spatial derivatives of b. And on the far right hand side, I have two time derivatives of b. Okay, so putting that all together is going to be down here. I want to make one more simplification, which, which is that this del cross del cross b, two spatial derivatives of b, it turns out, okay, so there's one cool trick that I'm not going to prove to you, but it's a one cool mathematical trick to use here, as this vector identity is what it's called. It turns out that del cross del cross b, well, okay, del cross del cross anything is the same as minus d squared by dx squared plus d squared by dy squared plus d squared by dz squared. And this doesn't just work for magnetic fields, it works for anything. So this is a vector identity. It would take us a couple of pages of math to prove it, so we'll just take that from Wolfram Alpha, okay? But suffice it to say, this is two spatial derivatives, and this is two spatial derivatives, okay? So here, that gives me all together then. See, I have a minus sign here that cancels that minus sign. So equating all of this together, I have now d squared by dx squared, plus d squared by dy squared plus d squared by dz squared of the magnetic field is 1 over c squared d squared by dt squared b. Whew, that's a lot to say, all right? But 
Let's stare at that. On the left-hand side, I have two space derivatives, right? Del, I have a del squared by del x squared. And on the right-hand side, I have two time derivatives, OK? So if you take this equation to the math department and knock on the door and say, well, I have a differential equation. Which, what, what solves this? They'll tell you it's a wave, OK? So this is a wave. So these two equations together, we fed one into the other, and we got this equation, OK, for the magnetic field. I started, remember what I did was I started from del cross b, and I took the curl of that, and then fed in the other equation. I could have started with del cross e, taken the curl of that, and then fed the other equation in. So I could go either direction. So these two Maxwell equations together, the ones that talk about a changing field causing a curl in the other field, when you feed them back in together, you see that I have a wave equation in B, and I have a wave equation in E. Okay, I didn't show you the wave equation in E, but it's the same math taking a slightly different direction. Okay, do you have questions so far? All right, so this comes right out of the Maxwell equations in a region of space where I don't have charges and I don't have currents. How do you solve a differential equation? You know the answer, okay? These differential equations are famous. They are the wave equation. So this is the wave equation, and you read off the, the velocity right here. I'm sorry, the speed. You read off the speed right here. C is the speed of light. So this tells you that when an electromagnetic wave is propagating in a region of free space, it always travels at the speed of light, okay? And it's, it's waving. And it's also, <laughs> this is the lovely piece here, this is what enables all of wireless communications. All wireless communications are, are built on these wave equations. So again, if I handed you the sheet of Maxwell equations and you had a time machine and traveled back in time 300 years, you'd have all the intellectual information you need to start doing things like thinking of wireless communications like cell phones, like satellites, Okay, like radio and TV, all that old school stuff, all right? Uh, okay, this is a cat that's waving. Cats don't travel at the speed of light. So this, the cat is not a solution of the equation. But the cat's waving, and it was late at night, and I thought the cat was cute. Okay, so this is a wave equation with speed c. The solution to what we have is waves. Let me show you now that the solution to this equation is waves, right? That's how we do this. We, we know the solution should be a wave. I'm going to write down a wave, and we'll just show that it actually works. So you need the equation, the wave equation, all right? And I'm also going to need to take some derivatives of a wave, okay? The standard waveform we put in is a sine or a cosine. So let me remind you how to take derivatives of sines and cosines. So d by dx of sine is cosine. d by dx of cosine is minus sine. All right, if you're like me, you have trouble remembering where that darn minus sign goes. So, uh, well, at, at, the, uh, you know, at the risk of being undignified, let me help you remember this. Okay, I made up a little rap for this. You ready? Cosine is negated when the sine is integrated. Did I tell you guys that before? Okay, cosine is negated when the sine is integrated. So uh, when the sine is integrated, so integrate a sine and cosine is negated. Okay? Cosine is negated when the sine is integrated. Never forget it, right? Now you get the sine down. Okay, so if you translate this, translate this into derivatives, okay, what this is going to tell you is that the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So that's what I have here. All right? Derivative of cosine is minus sine. So I'm going to use these um, trig identities, basically, well, trig differentials, uh, in order to show you that a wave, a sine wave, solves that equation. So we're going to use this one cool trick, which is I'm going to need two spatial derivatives of a sine wave. So d squared by dx squared of sine is d by dx of, well, the first derivative of sine is cosine. Now I need to take a derivative of that, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So here's the key. Two derivatives of sine is minus sine. That's, that's the key here. So two derivatives of sine is minus sine. So you can already kind of see that if I feed in a sine wave on the left-hand side, I'll have two derivatives of it, which gives me a minus sine wave, right? And on the right-hand side, the same thing will happen. I'll take two derivatives of a sine wave, which will give me minus that sine wave. So it must work out. So we'll show you how that works out. Let me try this waveform. I'm going to try an electric field of a traveling waveform. So that looks like this. E naught sine of kx minus omega t times z hat. 
E naught just means there's some number in front that's got the units of electric field, okay? The sine part, sine of kx minus omega t. All right, so when you see a sine of x, you know what it does. It's a function that does this. The k tells you the wavelength, all right? So, um, so you know, the, how fast it waves is going to be related to k. k is actually 2 pi over lambda, by the way. So if I have a really long wavelength, then I actually have a small k. Um, so the fact that I have a kx minus omega t, what that means is as time goes on, the coordinate that the sine gets fed is changing. All that's going to do is take your, your sine waveform and shift it, in, shift it in, in space, basically. As time goes on, your sine wave is going to travel. This, this is set up so that the sines work out. I've got a minus sign in the middle, such that this sine wave travels forward along the x direction in time. So I know that because there's an x there. The z hat, okay, there's a lot of geometry going on here. The z hat means that the direction of the electric field is in the z direction. <coughs> so let's, let's choose some axes. Let's say that that's the x axis. Coming out to you is the y axis, and up is going to be uh, the z axis. So this tells me I'm looking at an electric field that's, that's along the z axis, okay? So it's, it's pointing up or pointing down, depending where I am in space, but it's a sine wave. So it's pointing up here and then down there and up here and down there. That's what that sine wave looks like. And then that whole pattern is shifting forward in time along the x-axis. Do you have any questions about what the waveform means? Okay. All right. So that's what that waveform means. And now I want to show you that mathematically it fits the wave equation. Okay. It's a traveling wave solution of the wave equation. So it better work. So d squared by dx squared plus d squared by dy squared plus d squared by dz squared of this waveform, I've only written down one term here. What happened to my other terms? What happened to them? It's okay to speak up. I, I kind of heard some whispers of it. Yeah, the other terms are zero, okay? So if I look at this function, there's an x there. So I will get a derivative with respect to x, okay? So I know that term's going to survive. If I think of the derivative with respect to y, there's no y in here. So that derivative has to go away. What about the derivative with respect to z? I have a z hat there. What's, what's, what's the deal with that, right? Z hat's just a unit vector that never changes. So it's, it's not changing. There's no, you know, the derivative of z hat is 0. So the only term here that's left is a d squared by dx squared of e. And two derivatives of a sine wave gives me minus the sine wave. Okay? There's also two powers of k that come out. So altogether, this is minus k squared e naught sine of kx minus omega t in the z hat direction. Right? Now when I take the, so that was the left hand side of this wave equation. The right hand side is 1 over c squared d squared by dt squared of e. Two time derivatives of the sine wave will also give minus the sine wave. Okay? So once again, I get minus the sine wave. What came out is I had two powers of omega come out because of the time derivative. Actually, two powers of minus omega. So minus omega times minus omega is plus omega squared right here. The minus sign is from taking two derivatives of the sine. So I have minus omega squared over c squared e naught sine. That c squared was already in the wave equation here. So I've almost shown you that it works. Basically, if we know that this part is equal to that part, then it works. Then our sine wave s solved the, the wave equation. Okay? Oh, go, go figure. A wave solves the wave equation. So if omega is equal to ck, then this works. And in fact, that's correct. That's how we know how omega and k are related, is that this omega must be related to that k by the factor of c. Do you have any questions so far? Or complaints? Yes, please. Oh, omega. Okay. So, <clears throat> omega is. Um, so, if I talk about the frequency of the wave in hertz, okay? So, you've heard of hertz, right? So, like, for example, the, um, the uh, electric current that's being delivered by the, the power company in, inside the building, you know, is, is jiggling at 60 hertz, okay? 60 hertz is the frequency F. Omega is 2 pi times that. So that's what omega is. Omega is 2 pi f. Good question. OK? Other questions? All right. 
So, now, does B wave 2? What I've shown you is that I have the wave equation for E, and I showed you that, yes, a sine wave solves the wave equation for E. All right? But I also, given that that's E, I'd like to see what the magnetic field is as a result of that due to Maxwell's equations, right? So Maxwell's equation says all I need to do is take the wave that I already have in E, use del cross E as minus dB by dt, and that'll tell me what's the form of the magnetic field, okay? So we'll feed it in. So let's take del cross E of what we have, and the way you set up del cross is any cross product you can set up as uh, this determinant of the matrix, x hat, y hat, z hat, the del vector, okay? Remember how the del vector went? Um, the del vector is, is a vector operator, but you just follow the same script that you always follow, which is that the pieces of whatever this vector are go right here. So del itself was d by dx, that goes there, d by dy, that goes there, and d by dz, that goes there, okay? And then E has uh, only a Z component. So when I write down the components of E down here, it's 0, comma 0, comma EZ. Okay? So that's how we set that up. And now we just take uh, that determinant. And uh, you, you use the algorithm you like for taking determinants. I like to think of taking the diagonal lines down and to the right, and then diagonal lines down, I'm sorry, up and to the right. So the diagonal line down and to the right gives me an X hat with a D by DY with an EZ. Okay, so that means I'll have a d by dy of ez right here in the x hat direction. And then going up and to the right, I'll catch an ez and a d by dx and a y hat. So that means I'll have a term that's minus d by dx, ez, y hat. Now one of those two terms is zero. Now's the time in lecture when we play which term is zero. So one of those two terms is zero. Which one's zero? What do you think? Is the first term zero or is the second term zero? And the way you can answer that question is you go back to EZ. Here's the form of E, okay? Everything in front of the Z hat is EZ. So does this thing have a, a, does this thing have a derivative with respect to X or does it have a derivative with respect to Y? Yeah, it's got a derivative with respect to, to X, okay? So if I take D by DY of this function that has no Y dependence, it's zero. So this term is zero. Okay, so I'm left with minus d by dx, easy, uh, in the y hat direction, okay? So now I, I need to take one spatial derivative of e, so the, the e naught comes down, one derivative of sine is cosine, so I have the, the k comes out and I have a cosine of kx minus omega t, it's all in the y hat direction, notice that y hat snuck in there, right? The y hat is, is coming in because of the crossed <laughs> derivative. We started off in an electric field pointing in the z-hat direction. Maxwell's equation tells us to take a crossed derivative to figure out what the magnetic field is, and that crossed derivative is the thing that left of, with the y-hat, okay? So I have a y-hat here, and that's equal to minus db by dt, okay? Do you have any questions so far? All right, okay, so continuing on then, what I need to do now is look at this differential equation and figure out, well, What's the form of B that's going, to, that's going to do that, all right? And in this case, I don't need the, the math department for this one, okay? We can, we can think about this one and, and try something and, and show that it works. So let me, let me see what happens here. If I take um, this equation here and, and um, think of putting in a particular magnetic field. So think of putting in magnetic field equals minus E naught K over omega sine of KX minus omega T, all right? If I take the time derivative of this guy, all right, when I take the time derivative of this guy, derivative of sine is cosine, I'll come out with another minus omega. So the minus signs will cancel, the omega will cancel, and I'll, I'll be left here with an E naught, okay, over a C, E naught over C, sine KX minus omega T, all right? So this all, all comes together here, all right? And if I take the time derivative of this guy, I'll see that it gives me this, right? So feed in the time derivative of that and I get what I already had. So here's the deal. This electric field that was in the, the electric field we started off with is a sine wave where E is in this Z hat direction, okay? I'll just remind you what E meant and then we'll figure out what's the B that went along with it. So we set up an electric field that points in the Z direction, Z is up, okay? And yet, as I walk along in space, it's going up and then down, it's following a sine wave, it's up and then down, okay? And that whole thing is traveling as well, all right? 
Now the B component that came out, okay, Maxwell's equations told us how the magnetic field had to go. The, the, the magnetic field is pointing in the y-axis, which is towards you guys, okay? So the B component is, is a sine wave. It's coming out and then back and then out and then back. And it's varying as I walk along the coordinate x, okay? And the whole thing is traveling in the x direction. The kx minus omega t means shift this thing in time forward. All right, so all together then, it means the wave, right, has to be not just electricity and not just magnetism, it has to be both and. It has to be what we call an electromagnetic wave. And those equations together look like this. If left hand is electric field and right hand is magnetic field, it's doing this. It's going out and then negative and then this way and then negative. And who knew that disco came out of Maxwell's equations? Yes? Okay. So that's what that looks like. Do you have any questions? All right. Good. Because I'm not doing that dance again. All right. Okay, so this is a self-sustaining wave that can go on forever. Remember, we said we had these pieces of Maxwell's equations that said a time derivative in one field caused a curl in the other, and then a time derivative of that field caused a curl in the other. So that feedback effect back and back and back and back is this. Is this. It's, it's a wave. So it's a self-sustaining wave that keeps self-propagating, and it can go on forever, and this is actually light, all right? So, uh, and, and it, it propagates at the speed of light. The way you know it's the speed of light is because the speed is omega over k. Um, and omega over k, we said, has to be c for these equations to work. So this is propagating at the speed of light. Questions so far? OK. All right, this is what that dance looked like, that disco dance I did. Looks like this graphically, that the electric field is in, in one axis. All right, and then the form of it follows a sine wave, right? The magnetic field is along a different axis, and it follows a sine wave, and then the whole shape travels in time. So E and B are perpendicular to each other, and they're also perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Okay, and in fact, V, the, the velocity of the traveling wave, is parallel to E cross B. So if I look at this, um, this graph here, I'd see that E cross B gives me this direction, so that wave's traveling this way. Or when I was doing this wave here, right, when I had electric field going up and down and magnetic field coming back and forth, E cross B meant that wave had to travel this direction. Okay. So what's the, uh, what's the magnitude of V? What's the, what's the value of V? If I just said, what's the magnitude of V? Yeah, it's C. It's the speed of light. So the magnitude of V is the speed of light. And no, kittens can't travel at the speed of light. Sorry, kitten. Not unless you're a photon. It's a photonic cat. It's, there's no photonic cats. All right. So electromagnetic radiation can happen at several different wavelengths. So remember what I said is that there's a, there, let's go back to the diagram. There's a wavelength to this, right? The wavelength is go up, go down, and come back. That distance is the wavelength. Or this is another graphical representation of it. Go up, go down, come back. That distance is the wavelength. Even though that wave's going to travel by, you can still measure the wavelength. So what's written down here is different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and how we experience them as humans. Okay? There's a tiny sliver in the middle, which is visible light, right there. So visible light is happening. Oh, it's, it's basically. You know, in this, in this region, it's, it should be something like hundreds of nanometers, okay? So, um, small, right? So, right here is 10 to the 6. You can't see a micron, all right? Micron is about the width of your hair, but you can see about a tenth of that. So, if you take a tenth of the width of your hair, that's the wavelength of the photons that are going into your eye and exciting something that allows you to see light. Um, if I go a little bit... Uh, longer wavelength, that gets to be what's called the infrared. Infrared just means longer, okay? So infrared would be, uh, this is showing us that it starts around, around microns, okay? So things like that big or so are infrared light. Now, there's a lot of infrared, in, infrared, infrared light in the room that your eyes can't detect. But if you had night vision goggles on, okay, if we turned off all the lights, pitch black, and everyone had night vision goggles, you would see that every person in this room is glowing. And the glow that your night vision goggles are picking up 
is the infrared radiation that people put out because they're at a particular temperature. Everything has a particular glow according to its temperature, and based on your temperature, you're radiating in the infrared. Ultraviolet light, okay, these are the UV things that cause us to use sunscreen. So the sun puts out a very broad spectrum, okay, um, and it peaks in the visible. And the ultraviolet components are the ones that, well, they're very tiny wavelengths, okay? You see how the ultraviolet stuff is getting to be like a nanometer, all right? Very tiny wavelengths. Actually, it turns out as you go along this chart, the smaller wavelengths, the tinier stuff, actually end up being higher energy photons. Okay, when you think of it in terms of Einstein's little packets of energy, it turns out that the packets come in in um, higher energies for the smaller wavelengths. But you can also kind of imagine that if I get a really, really, really small wavelength that starts to be able to flick um, atoms around, and what happens with the UV radiation is it gets into your skin and it flicks your DNA around, causes cancer, so wear sunscreen. X-rays, if you've had an X-ray at the doctor, okay, those are even tinier waves but higher energy, and gamma rays, okay, don't, don't, don't get involved with those. Um, now going the other direction, the longer wavelength stuff. Here's kind of some fun things, okay, some radio and television over the waves. I don't know how many people do this anymore, but anyway, way back in the day, we would get TV just over the airwaves. It was by electromagnetic radiation. Same thing with the radio bands, the FM band and the AM band. Does anybody know what this band is, the amateur band? Anybody happen to have an amateur radio license? Anybody here a licensed broadcaster? Really? Okay, well, I'm an amateur radio broadcaster. I have a ham radio license. Now, the reason I have one is because I love my husband. All right, so when I got, so, you know, you do things when you get married because, you know, you love your spouse and, 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 and you, you got to play along. So I married into this wonderful family of ham radio operators. And basically they looked at me and they said, what, you're a physicist, go get a license. So, okay. Right, so I took the test, I got a license. So I'm authorized to uh, put out transmissions on the amateur band. Uh, okay, so these are all electromagnetic radiation, but they're at different wavelengths, okay? So these are rather long wavelengths. These guys go from like a meter up to uh, a kilometer, okay? So some radio waves are basically the size of this room. So think of that, all right? So um, microwaves, this is the fun one. This is actually, the, your microwave oven is using <laughs> waves that are in this range here. All right, so about a millimeter, about a centimeter, maybe about you know, a few centimeters. You can actually find out, you can actually find out the wavelength of microwave radiation that your microwave uses. Would you like to know how? So here's how to do it. Uh, uh, don't make a mess if you do this, okay? But you need a big bar of chocolate. So take your microwave oven, take the turntable out, take the biggest bar of chocolate you can find and put it in there and, and hit go. Now. Watch very carefully, because you don't want to melt the whole bar. That'll make a mess, and your roommate will be very mad at you, okay? And then don't say, I told you to do it. But if you watch very carefully, watch for when it just starts to melt. What you'll find is that there'll be some little dots. It'll start to melt at a few distinct locations. Those are the places where the wave is really wiggling the highest, and the distance between those is half the wavelength, okay? So you can measure the wavelength of radiation in your microwave oven by slightly melting a chocolate bar. Okay. Questions about any of that stuff? That's just sort of physics in your life. It's all this electromagnetic radiation. It's all the same um, phenomena. It's just that we experience it differently at different wavelengths. Um, and really, to measure the entire spectrum requires some sophisticated equipment. All right. Now, physics in your life, color vision. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about why it is that you perceive colors and how you do that. So your, your eyes have a few different types of receptors in them back in the retina. You have rods and cones. The rods are things that are just looking for intensity of light. Is there some light present or not? They don't care about which color. And they're very sensitive to <coughs> small intensities. So at night, when you know, you're, you're basically using your rods. But if there's enough light intensity around, then the light excites your cones. Okay, this is why you can see in color during the daytime, but at night you really can't perceive color. So the cones tell you the different colors, and what you have basically is you have some cones in your eye that are tuned to red, some are tuned to green, and some are tuned to blue. So the, the blue ones peak around uh, 440 nanometers. The green ones peak 
around 540 nanometers, and the red ones peak around 560 nanometers. And that roughly corresponds to those, those little specific organic molecules, okay, whose job is to pick up that frequency of light. So basically, when that frequency of light comes by, they grab it and they, they send a signal to your brain. So your brain isn't measuring all, so your eyes aren't measuring all colors. Your eyes are just measuring three specific wavelengths of colors, and then your brain interprets all of that as green or orange or purple or whatever. Okay? And here's another kind of fun fact. Unfortunately, not everybody sees in all three of those colors, right? There's a phenomenon called color blindness, which can knock out one of those cones. And so if, you, if you're colorblind, it typically means that you're, you're, one of your cones is defective and you're not seeing all three colors, you're really just seeing two, typically. Um, so about 10% of men have color blindness, because uh, it's, 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 um, it's carried on the X chromosome, so if you only have one X chromosome, you can't compensate. Women are much less likely to have color blindness. They need to have two of those X chromosomes that have the, the color blindness on them in order to be colorblind. So one, roughly 1% 1 of women are colorblind. But here's another fun fact, right? And again, I'm not a biologist, so you really want to check me up on this. But I've been told by biologists that women have two X chromosomes. So think about this. If there's a mutation that gives you a slightly different cone color, all right, if you only had one X chromosome, you probably wouldn't notice. But if you had two X chromosomes and one of your mutations said, I have a slightly different cone color, wow. Now you'd have four kinds of cones, right? Okay. So there are some women out there who have this mutation, and they, rather than having three different colors of cones, they have four different colors of cones. They're called tetrachromats. Okay. How do you know if you're a tetrachromat? What you'll find is that RGB screens really frustrate you, because RGB screens are expecting those three cones that most people have. And if you're a tetrachromat, you have an extra cone that's a different frequency and you'll just be forever frustrated by RGB screens. They just don't give the right colors. So that's how you know if you're a tetrachromat. Questions? It's kind of fun, physics in your life. If you happen to be a tetrachromat, let me know. I don't know, just never met one before. So, questions so far? All right, now I need to teach you about accelerated charges. And uh, what we showed so far was that there is this phenomenon called electromagnetic radiation waves that can, that can self-propagate. The question is, how do you get them started? So here's how you get them started. You need to take some charges and shake them. So if you take some charges and wiggle them back and forth, they put out electromagnetic waves. Okay. Now, how can we think of what that looks like? Um, I got to confess, I spent all week trying to rederive this stuff that's in the book. So let me tell you kind of the cheater's version of how to understand this. Um, and, and again, it, it took me a while to work out this math because your, your book left out an important piece in my mind. So let's do the following experiment. Let's say that there's a charge in the middle of the classroom right over here. So let it be whatever charge you like, say a positive charge, okay? And it's putting out an electric field, all right? And I, the observer over here, can observe there's an electric field radiating out of, that, well, coming out of that charge. Now, say the charge all of a sudden moves to a new position. If the charge moves to a new position, in order to do that, it had to accelerate, all right? In the new position, I'm going to measure a different electric field, right? I was measuring an electric field pointing this way. The charge moved. I'm now measuring an electric field pointing that way. But the information about the charge moving takes time to get to me, right? So the charge moves, and I don't find out until the electric field has had time to adjust. And it adjusts at the speed of light. So at the speed of light, coming from that accelerated charge, there'll be basically a sphere of information, right? Beyond that sphere, nobody knows yet that the charge moved. If you're inside the sphere, you know the charge moved, okay? So there's a sphere of information coming out, all right? And the sphere travels at what speed? Speed of light, right? So all electromagnetic disturbances travel at the speed of light. So this is a graph of that sphere of new information. Which, and the new information is the change in the electromagnetic field. Okay? So an observer here at 1 already knows that the charge moved. The observer here at 2 doesn't know yet. And then as that sphere propagates out at the speed of light, now observer 2 gets the message. But here's what it looks like to you, the observer. Okay? We see that charge, and we see the electric field pointing this way. The charge moves, and now the electric field is going to change. But during the change, I see a big, you know, I see a big effect. I see that, whoa, it changed. When it changed direction, there's a large, what we call transverse component. Transverse meaning here, transverse to the sphere. So the sphere is coming out, 
and I can think about, well, what kind of disturbances are happening? The main thing I'm going to notice as that sphere goes by me is I'm going to notice changes, all right? So there'll be a change in the electric field on that sphere. Some of the changes, now I'm going to break it up into a radial component, okay, which is radial to the sphere, and then I'm going to break it, some of it up into parallel components on the sphere, and we'll call that transverse, okay? So there's the radial component, and then there's the transverse components. So I want to know what all those changes look like. It turns out that the radial disturbances fall off like one over r cubed. This is what I finally calculated this week. So the, the radial disturbances fall off like one over r cubed. The transverse disturbances, okay? So if I see that charge move, I'll detect um, a changing electric field, one bit's radial, one bit's transverse. The radial bit is small and it just falls off like one over r cubed, so it's very hard to measure. So the main thing you're going to measure when this disturbance goes by is a transverse electric field, because it's large. It falls off like one over r. So at large distances, okay, at large distances, since one over r cubed falls off so much faster than one over r, all you're going to measure is the transverse field. This is, so this is what took me all week to figure out. This is why your book focuses on the transverse component, okay? So, when your book is talking about the radiative field, they focus in only on the transverse piece because at long distances, that's actually all you can measure. So, one falls off like one over R cubed, one falls off like one over R. Do you remember how the electric field of a point charge falls off? One over what? Excellent. Oh man, lots of people participated in that one. Excellent. Everyone gets a star for the day. So, one over R squared. So, this transverse radiative field falls off like 1 over r, but the static field falls off like 1 over r squared. So this is a very long range thing, all right? What that means is that if I'm far away from a charge, let's say there's a charge in the next room and it's oscillating up and down, and I try to measure the radiative field coming off of it, which is this transverse field that if the thing keeps wiggling, then I'll keep noticing it and I'll keep seeing this transverse field. If I try to compare the magnitude of that transverse field to the magnitude of the bare field coming off of it, the one that falls off like 1 over r squared, at long distances, I'm going to find that the, by far the dominant effect is this transverse field. So this is actually, so for example, when we're measuring, um, we can actually measure electric fields that come off of stars, right? Okay? They're very, very far away. We don't measure the direct electric field that's falling off like 1 over r squared from all those charged particles, okay? Never mind the fact that the star is actually net neutral, okay? But the charges are wiggling and they put off electromagnetic radiation, okay? And then that wiggly bit falls off like 1 over r. So that's, that's, this is part of what allows us then to, to measure that stuff at large distances. Do you have any questions so far about that general idea? Okay. All right, now I need to tell you a little bit about the geometry. So we'll focus in on the transverse radiative field because that's the dominant component. And that's what's denoted here in the diagram is that as you shift this electric field, there's a, there's a large transverse bit that runs by you. So the transverse pulse propagates at the speed of light, okay? Because there's a, ch uh, what I would observe is that I'd observe, oh, the electric field changed in my region of space. A changing electric field has to have a magnetic field with it. And you already know how this goes. A, a disturbance in the electromagnetic field propagates at the speed of light, and it has the following properties. E is perpendicular to B is perpendicular to V. So this change radiating off of that particle, if I sense a transverse electric field this way, the magnetic field must be perpendicular to both the electric field and the velocity of propagation. So there's only one direction left, right? If E is this way and the wave is propagating that way, the B must be this way. So that tells you the directions. E is perpendicular to B, and it's all perpendicular to the direction of propagation of this sphere coming out at the speed of light. Now, we also want to understand a little bit more about the magnitude. Now, I'm not going to go through this calculation for you because it's, it's in the back of your book. It takes several pages. But let me tell you who the calculations do to. Many years ago, there was a young man sitting right here, okay? Name is Edward Purcell, and he got his Bachelor of Science degree in, in electrical engineering at Purdue. He went on to win the Nobel Prize. This argument is due to him. So basically, the idea is the following. We got the direction to get the magnitude. You can do a Gauss's law 
uh, analysis. So the Gauss's law would say, you know, find yourself the Gaussian box and very carefully draw the geometries out and figure out which way the, the fields go. So the end result of that two or three page calculation is this, that the radiative electric field, by which we mean the transverse component because it's dominant, the transverse component of the radiative electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times minus Q A perpendicular over C squared R. Let me tell you what that means, okay? So first of all, notice it falls off like 1 over R. So it's a very long range phenomenon. Also, there's something called A perpendicular. So what's that? Here's that sphere of disturbance propagating out from the charge that moved. Here's our observation point, and I'm looking directly at the charge that has moved. The charge accelerated, let's say it accelerated in this direction, but according to my vantage point, according to my observation point, the only component of acceleration that I could see is the transverse acceleration. So this diagram here defines that symbol A perpendicular. It's the transverse component. And now the, what the equation tells me is that if I looked over here, the charge accelerated this way, I only noticed the transverse component, the electric field is in the opposite direction. The electric field is in the minus Q A perpendicular direction. So that's what I measure. Do you have any questions about how to interpret that? Okay. All right. So unfortunately, we just ran out of time, and I didn't get to tell you why the sky is blue. So I'm sorry about that. But I do have to end class because we're out of time. And if you want to know why the sky is blue, come forward. I'll fill you in.